Good morning. Great to be here this morning. I've been a professor at the University of Maine for 25 years, dedicated my life uh, to educate students in the state, but also develop ideas that can help transform our economy and improve our world. Uh, today, I'm going to tell you about a mission we're on. It's not a job, it's a mission. How do we take the state of Maine in a direction to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, create jobs, and help protect the environment? Um, it, it's not an easy one. We don't have all the answers, but we've developed a plan to get there. Uh, I work at the Composite Center at the University of Maine, which I started about 25 years ago. Uh, the center right now is a world leader in developing advanced materials and construction. Here's an example of things we've done that we've, told, we've been told 10 years ago, it can't be done. Professor Dagger, you're crazy. Uh, and uh, th this is a bridge in a backpack. What you see up in the upper left-hand corner here is the University of Maine hockey bag. We love our hockey team at the University up in Orono. <laughs> and the, the bridge fits in a bag. It can be inflated, uh, and you can make a 60-foot arch come out of a, a, of a University of Maine hockey bag. Uh, and uh, th this technology has uh, been patented by the university. It's been um, taken off by the private sector. Uh, the, they've uh, hired our students. We have a business in Maine that over the last, the last year uh, built 10 bridge in the backpack bridges that are carrying highway loads across the state of Maine and now in Massachusetts. Uh, that technology uh, right now is also, also leaving the state of Maine to go overseas in Russia and many other places. So yes, we were told it can't be done, but we knew it could, and we did. <laughs> so so, so let, let's talk about some of the major challenges we're facing in Maine. What happens at $4 a gallon in the state of Maine? When we're paying $4 a gallon in, in gasoline and, and heating oil, $5 billion leaves the state of Maine every single year. The entire state budget is $3.1 billion, and $5 billion leaves the state of Maine. So when we're out in Augusta here, trying to figure out how to cut $100,000 and $200,000 out of a budget, the real issue here is we're bleeding $5 billion a year. And every time, heating oil prices and gasoline prices go up by $1, an extra billion dollars leaves the state of Maine, and we have no control over that. So the question is, how do we find re renewable resources, other resources, to reduce this dangerous reliance on fossil fuels? This is your family's budget in 10-year increments. Every pie is your family's budget. In 19, what you see in blue right there is the energy cost for your family. What you see in, in, in uh, light green is your, is your family health care cost. What you see in dark green is your family what's left to live on once you've paid your health care bills and your energy bills. And as you see, in 10-year increments, it doesn't look very good. Uh, you remember back in 2008 when we hit $4 a gallon? And we hit it again this year? What happens at $4 a gallon? $4 a gallon, 20% of your family income goes to pay energy bills. And your electricity isn't the problem. The problem is, is gasoline and heating oil. The average family in Maine has two cars. And to fill the, ga the gas tank on those two cars, you're paying $5,000 a year, as your family, your family is. To fill the, the oil tank in the basement, about 75% of us in Maine use heating oil to heat our homes. We're the most reliant state on heating oil in the country. Uh, and how much does it cost you as a family to, heat, to fill that tank in the basement every year? About $4,000 at $4 a gallon. Five plus four is $9,000. Electricity is only $1,000 a year. So we got $10,000 right now at $4 a gallon that leave your, your pocket and, and goes away from the state of Maine. And you add it up, that's where you get the $5 billion. So how do we, how do we reduce that? That's, that's the challenge that we've got. And what happens beyond $4 a gallon? How many of you believe we're not gonna go above $4 a gallon? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. okay, how many of you believe maybe five or six or $7 a gallon is not possible? In Europe, they're paying eight today. All right, so what, what if we get to $8 a gallon and 40% of families' income leaves the state of Maine? So we need alternatives, and that's what we've been searching for. To make a long story short, there was dozens of us that worked on alternatives. There's a lot of ways you can, you can create renewable energy, and all of them are important. Uh, however, what's the biggest opportunity that Maine has and the country has? This is a, a wind energy map of the United States showing where the wind is and isn't. Where, where the area is white, don't put wind farm, you're not gonna get much out of them, okay? <laughs> Uh, and, and then yellow is better than white, pink's better than yellow, purple's better than pink, and red and blues are the best. So where are the best winds? They're offshore. Well, how much offshore wind is there across the United States? There's, the, there's enough offshore wind within, within, within 50 nautical miles of the United States to power the country four times over. Okay? Off the coast of Maine, there's 149 gigawatts of offshore wind uh, within 50 nautical miles. What's a gigawatt? 
a gigawatt, one gigawatt is equal to one good sized nuclear power plant. Main Yankee is 0 .9, was 0 0.9 gigawatts. So, so how many gigawatts do we have? We have 149. So that's the equivalent of 149 nuclear power plants, when the wind's blowing, of course, churning every day of the month, every month of the year, and every year of the century. So, so, so how, do we, how do we take this wonderful energy and bring it back home? The question is, is how much electricity does the state of Maine use? Okay. We use 2.4 gigawatts. We're a summer peaking state. We use the most energy in the summer when we turn the ACs on in Portland. <laughs> okay. Okay. And, 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 and that's 2.4 gigawatts. That's, 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 that's only two nuclear power plants. So it takes two nuclear power plants to power the whole state of Maine. And how much do we have offshore? 149 nuclear power plants worth of wind. So does it make sense to go out there and try to figure out to bring it home cost effectively? We thought it did, and we're embarking on a mission to do that. Now, the other thing is, is, are we the only ones who use electricity? Of course we're not. There's a need here across the Northeast US to do that. The black dots you see on this map, every small black dot is 7,500 people. So when you look down, you see this, a lot of black dots together where Atlanta, Georgia is. But where do you see a lot of black dots? It's in our neighborhood, in the Northeast United States. The area from New York to Maine has 55 million people. 18% of the US populations, which currently pay the highest electricity costs in North America. Yeah. Now, all of those folks are going to need renewable energy in the future. There's an opportunity for us not only to take care of ourselves in Maine, but create electrons in Maine and sell them, just like we sell paper and lobsters. Okay. People tell me, why, can't, why, should we, why should we be creating clean electrons in Maine and selling them and to power, to power people using their, their, their TVs in, in, in New York and Boston? Well, because it creates jobs. Okay? If we had to eat all the lobsters that come off the Gulf of Maine here in Maine, <laughs> we won't have any lobster industry. <laughs> okay. uh, so, so what's the plan? How do, we, how do we develop offshore wind? Well, offshore wind actually is a developed industry in Europe. Europe is a leader in offshore wind technology that built the first offshore wind farm in 1991. But Europe has done one thing. It is shallow water offshore wind farms within 100 feet or less. They have shallow waters across Europe. Uh, and we don't. We don't off the coast of Maine. We have deep waters off the coast of Maine. So how do you build, build an offshore wind farm? What you do out there is you, you go out and say in 50 feet of water, and you have a big jack-up barge. It's a big barge that jacks itself off the seafloor, and it has a huge crane on it that can lift 400 tons, 300 feet up in the air. Now, these towers are not small that they're building. They're 300 feet to, to, to the hub from the water level. The blades are 150, 160 feet long. That's what they're putting out there. But it costs a lot of money to assemble these offshore because of all the equipment you have to get out there and the kind of weather you have to work with. So what we wanted to do is do it better than Europe. Okay. So what we're going to do is float these structures. Okay, float them, yes. Float uh, uh, structures that are bigger than the Washington Monument. Yes, I have not lost my mind. It can, it, <laughs> yes, it can be done. It can be done. Uh, there's, a, there's an Ocean Energy Task Force uh, that the previous governor put together that I served on that, that put a plan together after two years to generate five gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030 in the Gulf of Maine. Five gigawatts. That's five nuclear power plants worth of wind by 2030. That would be a $20 billion construction project, the biggest in the state's history. Okay. And would create thousands of jobs. What we'd like to do is, is generate this offshore wind, put it through a smart grid in the state of Maine, and use that to do two things. To basically use that, like those electrons to fill your cars using plug-in hybrid vehicles and electric vehicles of the future, and then use that to heat your homes. Therefore, essentially, we're substituting heating oil and gasoline for clean electrons developed in the Gulf of Maine. That's what we want to do. So we've put a plan together, and that's our clock a spiral clock, and that's the plan. And how do you fund a plan like this? What we did is uh, we put a proposal together to the Department of Energy under a, 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 a national competition they put together two years ago. And they asked universities and industries to come together and develop ideas that would help the country move forward in its a, a renewable energy world. Uh, and um, so there was 40 proposals from across the country, from universities and industries that came together. And they selected us after a review of our ideas to lead the country in the development of floating offshore wind turbines. So, so there's 35 companies working with us, a lot of them here in the state of Maine. And we've put a plan together to get there. Now, the plan is a 20-year plan. But within 10 years, we're going to have the first floating offshore farm. Now, you think 10 years is a long time, or it isn't. Remember when you were 10 years ago. Unfortunately, you've heard about 9-11. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Remember 9-11 is not a long time ago. So 10 years is not a long time to get there. 
Okay? And we're going to get there using this plan. The first thing we're doing is, is developing technologies, figuring out how to cut the cost down and develop the best way to float wind turbines. And then we've built uh, 1 to 50 scale turbines uh, over the last couple of, couple of months and tested them. I'll show you some of that. Following that, we're going to build larger prototypes and put them in the Gulf of Maine. The first prototype will go in the water next year, July of next year, off Monhegan Island. It's, it could be the first floating turbine off the U.S. coast. Then, then following that, we're going to build a small farm with only f five floating turbines. Okay, and that will be completed by 2017. Following that, we're going to expand that farm to a, to a 500 megawatt farm, almost half the size of a nuclear power plant by 2020. And following that, we're going to build a bunch of these to reach, tw to, to reach five gigawatts by 2030. I want to show you more details about the plan. So that's our clock, and it's ticking. <laughs> Uh, so the first thing we've done is over the last two years, we've designed uh, different ways to float wind turbines and built 150 scale, shrunk the, uh, the, the, the units that are bigger than a Washington Monument to about six feet high above the water. This is our students and staff who built this turbine. And then we tested them uh, in a wave wind basin. Okay, essentially, it's a big wave pool that we put these things in. And then with winds applied, these are all different designs we've put out in the wave pool. And, and here's what the wave pool looks like. And here's how you generate waves. I'm sure many of your, uh, your kids have loved being in wave pools. That's a scientific wave pool, a wave basin. And then we've created 240 different mid-ocean conditions, which means different scenarios, 100-year storms. This is a 100-year storm you're seeing here with 60-foot waves okay, uh, 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 over, uh, blowing against a wind turbine. And there's a 150-foot vessel. Uh, out there, if equivalent to a vessel, that's seeing a 60-foot waves. You don't want to be on that vessel on that day, okay? But look at the wind turbine, the floating wind turbine. It's doing fine. Notice the 60-foot wave is going to come again. I want to show it one more time. And that 150-foot vessel, scale vessel, uh, uh, is, uh, is seeing that 60-foot wave, which is three times the size of the tsunami wave in Japan. And then here you go. The floating wind turbine is do done fine. After six weeks of testing, three different designs, they all survived the loads. Uh, so the next step for us is get a little bit bigger, uh, over six feet. So we're going to put a 145-foot long structure in the Gulf of Maine off Monhegan Island. It looks like that on the right-hand corner. It's got a 90-foot rotor diameter, and it's a, it's a half size of a full-size unit. The full-size unit would be 300 feet to the hub. The full length of the unit would be as, as big as the Washington Monument. But we're not going to go there first. We're going to start with, that, with a smaller version. And the University of Maine had won unanimously from the legislature a lease on that pink area off Monhegan Island. If you've been on Monhegan Island, it's two and a half miles south of Monhegan Island. It's just a test site. There's going to be anything permanent up there, just for, for us to go out and test different designs. This is a design we've completed, and we're building it as we speak. October 1st, we're going to start cutting steel and welding it. We have two companies working with us, two small companies, one called Chimbro with 4,000 employees, and the other one called Bath Ironworks with 5,000 employees. Okay? Uh, and those two small companies are very excited to work with us. So Pete Figue at Chimbro, starting October 1st, will start building modules of this turbine. This is a footprint of the turbine. It looks like a star under the water. The, the diameter of that star is 100 feet. Okay? The whole unit weighs 100, uh, 240 metric tons. Uh, the, the modules are about 10 feet in diameter each. Then the, these beautiful modules will leave uh, Chimbro's facility and go out to Bath. And then Bath steam is going to weld it all together just like they weld the ship. We know how to build ships in Maine, don't we? So we're going to go ahead and weld this thing together. And that's what it looks like uh, in Bath shipyards in July of next year. We're going to have this wonderful turbine with a yellow star under the water, and then the turbine sticking out of that star uh, next to the destroyers. I love that view. And that's an, uh, that's an opportunity here for, to diversify our economy beyond, uh, the, uh, beyond what we do today and to build on what we know how to do very well. Then we're going to lift the whole thing up and put it in the Kennebec River. It's going to float. It's only going to sink about five feet. It's going to have a five-foot draft in the water. It's going to float. We're going to have a small tugboat tow it out to Monhegan Island. Here we go. Okay. And then following that, remember, it's 240 metric tons. It looks easy here with a cartoon, doesn't it? Okay. Then we're going to take this thing, and, and we're going to go down the Kennebec River, make sure we don't hit anything on the way. It doesn't look that big in real world compared to the Kennebec River. So we're going to go down there. You can see a small tugboat. 
It's bigger than, than Monhegan Island, right? Okay. No, it's not. It's only 145 feet to the hub, folks. Okay, it's 90 foot rotor diameter, and we're going to anchor it. Now, how do we anchor this thing? Okay, it's going to float above the water. If we keep it there, it's going to tip over, right? Well, no, we're not going to let it stay there like that with five foot draft. We're going to sink it. We're going to we have ballast inside, and we're going to fill it with water in the ballast. It's going to sink down, and then coming off the seafloor, we're going to have anchors. There are ropes that are uh, the high performance ropes that are four inch in diameter, uh, with buoys on top, about 45 feet under the water. The whole thing is going to sink down under the water and attach to these pre attached anchors. Okay. Then we're going to take the water off the ballast, and then and the whole thing's going to want to move up, right? Because there's all a bunch of air under it right now, and it puts tension on the anchors that keeps it from tipping over. And then being under the water, then we don't have as, as much waves essentially attacking this unit, and, and that's that's how we keep it, how it survives. Then the, then the boat leaves, and then uh, we're going to test it for three months and then get it out there. Okay. Then following that, we're going to build a small farm, and the main the main PUC put out a, a request for proposals for this farm. And, and then we, they received proposals, uh, uh, a whole bunch of proposals uh, right now, and then they're going to review them and then pick a developer that's going to build the small farm. Again, these units are not small. They'll be bigger than the Washington Monuments each. There'll be five megawatt turbines. But we're going to build only five of them to learn how to do that and do it right. Uh, so the next step is built by 2020, expand that to a farm. How big does a farm look like? What does a, unit, what, what does a nuclear power plant worth a, wind, worth a wind look like out there? Okay? We're going to place these farms over 20 miles offshore so you don't see them from land because of the curvature of the earth. I gave a talk in Portland not too long ago. There was about 600 high school students out there, and I told them, how many of you wake up in the morning, look across the Atlantic, and see the UK? <laughs> there was one student in the back of the room that did raise their hand. <laughs> My next question was, is what were you doing the night before? But, but, but uh, go, going back to this, is uh, if you go far enough away, you're not going to see this because of the curvature of the Earth. It doesn't matter how, 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 how clear the day is and what kind of binoculars you have, you're not going to see them. But, but, um, but how, how, how big does it look like out there? Well, uh, to build a farm that's 500 megawatt in 2020, that would be, have 105 megawatt turbines. There'll be 100 turbines in there. They'll be six tenths of a mile apart, and altogether they'll take up a piece of real estate that's eight miles by four miles. It looks big here, uh, that's an actual size, but if we zoom out a little bit, that white rectangle that you see out there that says 20 miles offshore, that's what it would look like off the coast of Maine. That's a nuclear power plant worth a win. That's how big it looks like. Okay? Now, that particular farm, 500 megawatt, would be a $2 billion construction project that would create thousands of jobs in the state. We would like to replicate a whole bunch of them across the Gulf of Maine. So how many jobs can we create? Well, if we build five gigawatts by 2030, that'd be a $20 billion construction project. To put that in perspective, the east-west highway in the Gulf of Maine, in the state of Maine, would cost $2 billion to build. That's a $20 billion project. That would be, of course, financed through private investment that would come into the state of Maine. And if we're smart enough and build as many of these components with Bath and Chimbro and many other companies, we could create up to 15,000 jobs. Okay. Now, in the US, that, that market also could be 50 gigawatts by 2030. It could be a $200 billion market across the US. The UK is already embarked on a plan like this, but using fixed base turbines. The UK's plan is to put out 30 gigawatts by 2020 which means 25% of our electricity will come from offshore wind by 2020. They're out there doing it as they speak. That would create $120 billion of investment in the UK and 60,000 jobs. They just finished building the, first offshore, the, the largest offshore wind farm in the world. But it's all fixed space. We're going we're gonna to float these things and beat them by cost and beat them by efficiency. Okay? So going back, <laughs> here's our timeline one more time. I want to show it to you. I want to show it to you because we're on a mission. And that timeline is important to us. But we're only going to get there by all working together. So I'm here today to tell you there's a lot of opportunities for a lot of us to work together and embark on this, on this mission. We all need you. We all have to work together to make it happen. And I know we will. Thank you.